Hi everyone and welcome back to my channel or welcome to my channel if it is your first time here. My name is Jess and today I'm going to be sharing with you all the books that I read in the month of July and I had a mixed reading month in July. I read some books that I really enjoyed a lot uh, but no five star reads, no books that kind of blew my mind, just some good solid choices. So without further ado let's jump in and start talking about the books. So the first book that I read was Sin Eater by Megan Campisi. This is an arc which I received via NetGalley and it is historical fiction with a fantastical twist. Um, so we're following the story of a young girl called May who is caught stealing a loaf of bread and is sentenced to become her town's new Sin Eater. And Sin Eaters are basically women who are required to attend the dying. The dying confess their sins to the Sin Eater and then once that person has passed away the Sin Eater has to attend their funeral and eat the relevant foods in order to absolve the deceased of their sins by taking their sins upon themselves um, and because of that uh, they are feared and they are reviled by society so even though they spend all day surrounded by people hearing people uh, confess things to them they live quite a lonely and isolated existence and that is where May finds herself. Um, I really liked the concept of this book. I thought that it was really clever. Megan Campisi borrows heavily from British history which I thought was a cleverly done um, but I did find it took me out of the narrative a little bit because I was constantly trying to work out who everybody was. For example we have a virgin queen in this book called Bethany that's obviously um, the virgin queen Elizabeth um, and there were just various different characters that are along similar lines. Um, as I said, I thought that was really cleverly done. Um, for me, it fell down a little bit because I felt that it read more like a non-fiction, um, a non-fiction book about Sin Eaters. Um, there wasn't much character connection. There is a mystery element that runs throughout. So basically, May attends the palace in order to carry out her Sin Eater duties and she uncovers something that is going on in the palace. And I don't know if it's because I read a lot of fantasy and a lot of um, a very tropey premise in fantasy is that you have the underdog who somehow gains power um, and maybe manages to overthrow uh, the, the bad guy or the government or the power or whatever it is. Um, and I was really expecting there to be some kind of element of that in the story. So May uncovers something compromising is she going to use it to her advantage but she doesn't she just kind of ambles along in the life that she has been handed um and it just it didn't go in the direction that I expected it to um and yeah it just read very much like a non-fiction book rather than a fiction book and there just wasn't that much connection for me with the characters so I gave it 3.5 stars. As I said I really liked the concept, I thought that it was interesting. Um, Sin Eaters or the concept of Sin Eaters was something that was brand new to me. Um, I would definitely recommend it if you think that it sounds interesting. Um, yeah just I think I'd gone in and as I was reading I was imagining that the story was go going to go a certain way and it didn't um, and so it just fell a little bit flat for me but still very enjoyable. The next book that I read was also an arc from NetGalley and that was Sea Wife by Amity Gage. Now this was a mixed bag for me. Um, I really enjoyed the concept um, and I really liked the writing style but some of the content felt just a little bit clunky and overworked for my taste. So this is a story about Michael and Juliet and their two young children and Michael is feeling increasingly dissatisfied with his job and with his life in general. There is some kind of friction between Michael and Juliet with their marriage um, and their personal lives and so Michael persuades Juliet to buy a boat and go sailing with him for a year along with their children and right from the outset you know that something untoward or ominous has occurred whilst they are on this boat. I enjoyed the unique style of this book. We are reading first person perspective from Juliet's point of view but interspersed 
with entries from Michael via the captain's log which it features the technical details about their coordinates and where they are and where they're going but then also becomes more of a diary so we get his thoughts and feelings whilst they are on this journey and with Juliet's point of view we flick back and forth between the past and the present as we go on this journey to uncover what has gone on. I connected with Juliet as a character I really felt for her all the way through you know she is struggling to find and know her place in their family and um, she struggles with anxiety and depression because of a trauma that happened to her when she was a child um, and she just you become increasingly aware as the story goes on how lost she feels. Um, she was writing a dissertation and that got put to one side when she had her children and there was just a lot of her story that I could identify with and just I really felt for her. But as I said some of the content was just um, incredibly clunky I feel like is a very good way to describe it. So obviously Michael and Juliet are on this boat um, and every now and then you'd get something connected to the world of sailing which I'm not a sailor I don't like boats um, so I wouldn't necessarily pick up the references but every now and then scattered throughout was totally fine um, but it would occasionally veer into whole big paragraphs of sailing speech and technical content um, that just meant nothing to me and I ended up skim reading a lot of that and there was also some very odd political content just kind of thrust at you as a reader so one of the things that Michael and Julia are constantly pulling against one another with regards to is their political beliefs um, but it didn't really fit with the flow and ebb of the story uh, it was just like the author took this political thought that she had and dumped it right in the middle of the narrative and that was what let the book down for me apart from that I thought that it was really good I enjoyed the build-up to the mystery I would have liked the mystery element the mystery element to last a little bit longer uh, we kind of discovered what it was and then it was dealt with really quickly uh, but I thought that it was really good I'll also say uh, a big pet peeve of mine and I think it's something that I mentioned on the channel before is when authors inaccurately write children they often um, tend to age up children that they're writing so their actions or their speech is much more advanced than you would actually find in a child of the age and I thought that the author captured and wrote the children in this book perfectly um, and I really really like that it's not something that I often find in novels um, but it is a pet peeve of mine um, possibly because I am a mum um, I think if I didn't have children I wouldn't necessarily be aware of it but because I do um, it's just something that irks me but the author got that spot on so overall I thought that this was really good I gave it three stars um, I liked the sense of tension I liked the backdrop of this tempestuous ocean um, and how it wove together really well with the tension and the ominous feeling of the story in general um, and yeah I would definitely recommend it it wasn't mind-blowing um, I did as I said find myself taken out of the narrative by the technical sales speech and the political elements of the book but they weren't deal breakers for me um, overall just a solid three-star read the next book that I read was my book club's choice for the month. Uh, so I run a book club called Just One More Page Book Club. I'll leave the information to that down below if you want to join us. Uh, Bear Town by Frederick Buckman is our pick for August. It would be great to have you join in if that sounds like something you'd be interested in. But our pick for July was Dear Edward by Anne Napolitano. And um, there was some pressure when I was reading this because we had Anne join us for an author Q&A during our book club discussion so I was kind of reading it with that knowledge in mind but on the whole I thought that this was such a lovely lovely book so I gave it four stars it's the story of a young 12 year old boy called Edward who is the sole survivor of a plane crash the plane crash uh, wipes out his family and also 180 other people who were on the plane as well circa that I think it's about 191 people that die in total um, and the way that the story is set up is that we have two timelines we are following uh, Edward in present day as he deals with the aftermath, his grief, finding his place in the world and moving forwards and we also flash back to the plane journey so we discover who was on the plane and what happened to cause the plane to crash and it's done in a very slow 
atmospheric building kind of way. Um, I really, really enjoyed the setup. Some of the feedback that we got from the book club was that they just wanted to know right off the bat what had happened and they didn't like the slow build. I thought that it was fantastic. You definitely felt the tension, you felt the momentum and I thought that it was really, really good. Um, I also enjoyed the fact that you get um, different perspectives from some of the other passengers on the plane. Um, so you don't just get Edward's journey, you get to kind of peek into the lives and the stories of some of the other characters and my only criticism of the book would be that I wish that we'd had more information because there were some of the characters where it really felt like there was more to their story. Um, I thought that some kind of big um, twist or wow moment was coming for some of the characters and it just it just didn't happen and I would really really have loved that uh, mostly because I'm just so nosy and I love kind of peeking into other people's lives um, but yeah on the whole this is just a lovely poetic coming of age story um, obviously Edward suffers this huge trauma and he has to almost completely reinvent who he thinks he is um, and his worldview um, and how he's gonna even just move forwards with the knowledge that you know he lost his mum and his dad and his brother in one moment um, and yeah it's just done and portrayed in such a lovely way um, one of the twists of the story is that Edward comes across um, some bags in his aunt and uncle's garage which contain letters from family and friends of the people who perished on the plane um, and that just is a really interesting element because you know quite they're often some of them are just expressing their grief and um, some believe he's some kind of wonder child but others are putting requests to him and saying you know because you survived go on and do this um, for my brother who didn't and that kind of thing uh, and it's interesting to see how that changes and develops Edward and how he feels about that which I thought was a very interesting element as well and the reason that it lost the five star was simply because um, I felt like I wanted more from some of those other characters and I felt like Anne Napolitano alluded to more and then just didn't give it to us uh, I just felt like it could have gone that much further and developed the story that much further um, so it just felt like it was missing a little something but Obviously it's not an enjoyable topic to read about but I thought that it was done really well. As I said I would categorise it as a lovely poetic coming of age book so definitely one I would recommend. Then I picked up A White Chrysanthemum by Mary Lynn Bracht and if you watched my reading vlog of me reading this you'll know that I made the decision not to rate this because um, in terms of its fiction elements I thought that it was a little bit lacking but if I view it like a non-fiction in terms of it being eye-opening and informative about something that I wasn't knowledgeable about before that I thought that it was really really good. So this is set in two timelines. We have our more present day timeline and we have a historical World War II timeline and we are following the story of two sisters, Emmy and Hannah, who are Korean divers and one day Hannah is abducted by a Japanese soldier and she is carried off and forced to be what was known as a comfort woman. They are basically prostitutes for the Japanese army, or not even prostitutes, sex slaves for the Japanese army. So we follow Hannah's story from the point of her abduction and then we are following Emmy in a more present day timeline set in 2011 um, as she comes to terms with some of the guilt that she has carried over her sister's um, abduction um, and as she comes to terms with there's lots of cultural things about Emmy not talking to her children about who Hannah was and there's some kind of shame and guilt wrapped into who these comfort women were primarily because the Korean and the Japanese governments have made no acknowledgement that these comfort women were actually um, a thing. So it says in the back, and this was the thing that really struck with me, and I was just utterly, utterly horrified. So if I can find the timeline, hang on a second. Um, so basically, in 1991, um, a lady came forward to say that she had been a comfort woman. She'd been taken and she had been forced to become a sex slave. Um, and the Japanese government basically denied it, denied it, denied it. And then in 1993, they issued a statement which said, yes, we did have these comfort women and we did use them against their will. And then in 2007, Japan retracted that statement and said, yeah, no, that's, that's not true. 
um, and then in 2015, which is the last date in the back of this book, it says Japanese and South Korean governments announced a landmark agreement on the comfort women issue to remove the Statue of Peace and never speak of the comfort women issue again. So it, the author estimates that hundreds of thousands of Korean women were made to be comfort women by the Japanese army. They were abused, they were raped. It just is horrendous and the governments just want to know nothing about it and it just is awful and it's a part of World War II history that I was not familiar with and so from that point of view I'm very very glad that I picked this book up. It's very uncomfortable to read when you read Hannah's story and how she was used and how she was abused and just the very thought and knowledge that these women even were made to go through such a horrendous set of circumstances. It's not easy to read by any stretch of the imagination but I personally thought that it was very enlightening um, it was as I said it was something that I didn't know about and so from that perspective I'm very glad that I picked it up and read it um, and yeah I think that um, if you are interested in discovering more about this topic this would be a good book to read in terms of its fiction um, it falls down quite hard um, the characters of Hannah and Emmy are not super well developed um, and in the end I had to just kind of let that go and think well I just want to read it because I want to know um, rather than because I want to be wowed with a fantastic story. So this one was unrated. As I said I think if you're interested in learning more um, then this might be a good place to start um, but yeah can't really say much more than that about it. Then I did a really unusual thing for me in that I started a book, wasn't really loving it and decided to put it to one side. I'm just going to quickly mention it because I did say in a reading vlog that I had picked it up and that was Clockwork Angel by Cassandra Clare. Now I really like Cassandra Clare's writing. I got a little bit tired of the Mortal Instruments series but I was really looking forward to picking up the Infernal Devices because I'd heard really good things and I got, let me find my bookmark, 116 pages in but I just wasn't feeling it at all and normally I would doggedly persevere with a book but I just decided that I wasn't getting on with it I was ruining my reading experience I'm sure that at a later point I'll pick this up and love it so I put it to one side but if you're wondering why it disappeared from my wrap up and from my goodreads that is the reason and then the final book that I read in July is a mammoth book and that is The Truth About the Harry Kubert Affair by Joel Dicker and this is a massive book it took me forever to read um, so this is the story of Marcus who is a young writer and his mentor was a man called Harry Kubert and Harry lives in a small town I think in New Hampshire yes New Hampshire where in 1975 a 15 year old girl called Nola Kelligan disappeared and when Marcus discovers that Harry and Nola had a relationship and then worse when the remains of Nola are dug up and discovered on Harry's property a series of events begins to unfold and I am deliberately being really vague because one of the things I absolutely adored about this book was the fact that until pretty much the last page I was kept guessing and guessing as to what was actually going on. I had so many different theories um, it turns out it was very very close with one of my initial theories which I'm not going to tell you because it would spoil it um, but really it was just a shot in the dark. It was just one of many things that I thought about. At one point every paragraph I was changing my opinion about um, who or what I thought was really going on. Um, this is translated from the French and that is the only reason I think I didn't give it five stars. I have something of an issue with translated text in that I think particularly dialogue between characters often comes across really formal and stilted and it's not the way that we would actually say things and that's the only reason that this book probably didn't get five stars because it took me ages to get into it uh, because it just it didn't flow in the same way that I think it would have probably in the French it reads beautifully uh, but something just is a little bit lost I think in the translation and I thought that it was a little bit stiff and stilted um, but if you like mysteries that keep you guessing right up until the end then I would highly highly recommend this. It was very well executed, very well done, didn't have a clue. There were so many smoke screens and red herrings going right up and it was one of those books where right at the end something is revealed and you think yes how did I forget 
about that and it's such a key and important thing but the author does such a good job of distracting you with other things that you totally forget about it. Possibly the only other thing I would say is that it could have been a little bit shorter. There are points where I feel like we're going over old ground and it possibly could have been 200 pages shorter than it was. It did take me quite a long time to read it and I didn't necessarily find myself reaching for it. Once I was reading it, I would fly through it and I wouldn't want to put it down, but I didn't find myself desperate to jump back in, if that makes sense. But on the whole, a good solid read. Definitely one if you like mystery, definitely one if you like trying to guess who done it. Um, yeah, just a good solid four star read. So there you go, they are the books that I read in the month of July. As I said, it was a mixed bag, some really good impressive books, nothing that kind of blew my mind. Uh, no five star reads, which is actually quite unusual because normally I manage to scrape at least one five star read out of the month. Um, but I enjoyed the majority of what I read nonetheless. So thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please don't forget to give me the thumbs up. Subscribe to the channel if you want more content. Um, get, leave me a comment, let me know what your favourite book was that you read in July, or let me know if you've read any of the ones I've talked about and what you thought. Um, as always, thank you for watching. Take care, and I will see you all soon.